Hi, my name is Peter Avset. Uh, today I will give you a talk with the title Saudo Elastic Impedance, a Norwegian Sea Demonstration. The co authors of my talk are Tor Veglan, Martin Christensen, Kina Ordal at Telewall, and Fredrik Korn uh, with QI Labs. I will start with an outline of my talk. Uh, I'll give a brief motivation. Then I discuss a little bit about extending the elastic impedance and I'm going to demonstrate how we can use rock physics models to improve the calibration of extended elastic impedances. During this study, we're going to use data, seismic conversion data, from the Ittegrita field in the North Sea. And we're going to sh show some of these inversion data first, and then we're going to use these data and calibrate them to extended elastic impedances using rock physics models. Uh, we're going to use a method which I refer to as Sauda elastic impedance, which is just a different way to, to estimate these ex uh, elastic impedances. And finally, demonstrate how we can use these to map prospects in the area around Itagrita. Just to start with a little motivation, what we really want to do is to map lithology and fluids from the seismic data. And there are different approaches to this. Some people prefer a more model-driven approach, and personally I've used uh, rock physics models or templates during the seismic rest characterization. So building up uh, rock physics models in the seismic domain, for example VPVS ratio versus acoustic impedances, we can use these rock physics models to constrain seismic inversion or to help us interpret uh, inversion data. Another approach would be just data-driven, to look at deviations away from some background trend. It could be the fluid factor, the famous fluid factor, which is just a measure of the distance away from a background trend in an AVO crossplot, intercept versus gradient. Similarly, the extended elastic impedance is also a measure of an, a rotation angle uh, from the gradient axis, uh, as shown in the figure to the right. And the data-driven approach, extended and elastic impedance have become very popular in the industry and it's very fast and easy to implement and it's very robust and it was first uh, introduced by Pat Connolly in 99 and it's a very nifty te technique that also allows you to estimate what he referred to as extended elastic impedance from well log data and looking at different uh, angles of incidences, you could get curves that correlated with petrophysical logs and thereby you could estimate uh, extended elastic impedances from the seismic that corresponded to these different petrophysical parameters. One problem with the original extended or the, the original elastic impedance was that the dimensions would vary as a function of incident angle. So Whitcomb et al. in 2002 came up with the, the extended elastic impedance approach, which is a normalization of the elastic impedance to acoustic impedance. So the dimensions would be the same as acoustic impedance for any angle. They also introduced the chi angle instead of the angle of incidence, where the chi angle is a rotation in the intercept gradient uh, crossplot domain. Uh, the extended elastic impedance, if you put in a T angle of zero, would be s similar to the acoustic impedance. And it also turns out that at 45 degrees, the extended elastic impedance will correlate with the VPVS ratio. And that brings me to the focus of my talk, and that is really to try to evaluate these extended elastic impedances in terms of rock physics properties and see if we can actually use rock physics models to evaluate and maybe even better calibrate or constrain the, uh, the uh, extended elastic impedance attributes. This figure shows uh, cross plots of VPVS ratio versus acoustic impedance and all the data points are just randomly uh, generated data points, synthetic data points for different combinations of velocities and densities. And the colors represent the extended elastic impedances and the upper left corner is where the chi angle is zero. There we see a 
a one-to-one -one correlation with the acoustic impedance. So we're really plotting in colors the acoustic impedance, which is the horizontal axis and the crossbar. If you plot the extended elastic impedance at 45 degrees G angle, it turns out that the correlation will be uh, uh, one to one to VPVS ratio. So now we see the colors are going vertically, where the uh, impedance values are varying, uh, correlated very well with the VPVS ratio. So really what we want to do is to find an angle that corresponds to either fluid or lithology trends. And in the lower left corner, we see a cross plot where they rotated to minus 50 degree G angle. Now you see that the diagonal trend in the extended elastic impedance is going from the upper left corner down to the lower right corner of that subplot. And according to the rock physics model, going from the upper left to the lower right corner corresponds to increasing compaction or reducing porosity. However, if you look at the rock physics model that is included in the plot, you see that it's highly curved. It's not a linear trend which is coming out from the extended elastic impedance. So we need to make sure that if we want to really plot porosity or lithology changes, that the changes are corresponding to the rock physics trends for the given target zone. So you see that for this case, it's maybe a good correlation at intermediate extended elastic impedances in the light blue color area. But when it's the blue color or red color, the trends in the extended elastic impedances are not orthogonal to the rock physics compaction trend. Likewise, if you look at the lower right subplot, here we have a G angle of 24 degrees, and the colors represent the extended elastic impedances at this angle, and which is found to correspond well with the fluid trend at a given target depth. And that will be orthogonal away from the rock physics compaction trend. Uh, as we know, if we, for any given porosity, use Gassman, we will predict a fluid trend going from, uh, from the uh, upper right to the lower left in the cross plot of VPVS versus acoustic impedance. But again, because of the non-linearity or highly curved rock physics trend, we said that this fluid deviation from the background trend can vary as a function of compaction. So again, we need to make sure we find, uh, we normalize the extended elastic impedances uh, with values that take into account these compaction trends. So we can actually use rock physics models to help us to do that. So I'm going to show you how we can do this for a case study. It's from the Itegreta well. It's a gas condensate field in the Norwegian Sea. This figure just shows a map view of where we're located. It's uh, offshore Norway. And I've included in this figure some well log data. It's porosity to the left of the, in the log display. You have the water saturation in the middle subplot. And we see that it's very low water saturation in the gas zone, and you have the V clay, the clay volume, to the right. So the gas-filled reservoir is in the upper section of this well log data, as you see in this figure. The next slide, which I show now, is the CDP gather, where we can evaluate the seismic pre-stack data, and we can see that there is an AVO anomaly corresponding to this gas discovery. And it's a class 2 to 3 with a weak negative AVO uh, or uh, reflectivity at the near offsets becoming increasingly negative with FAR. And the well tie is just shown to the right there uh, together with the synthetic at the well location. We did uh, with QI, we have done uh, simultaneous AVO inversion of the data of CD gathers over a larger cube in this area. And this is just showing a display at the well location and a little bit away from the well log. So we get sort of a 2D section along seismic sections where we have inverted these AVO uh, data from the gathers into acoustic impedance to the left 
and VPBS ratio to the right. And the VLOG, VLOG has been implemented in the middle of the displays. And to the left of each of the seismic sections, you see the inversion curve. Blue is from the seismic and red is the observed VLOG data. And we see also a subtle gray background trend, which was a priori model, the starting model, and updating the seismic inversion till you get an optimal match between uh, your forward model and your data, we ended up with a blue curve. And we see that we are getting back, even though the background trend is a water sighted background trend, the seismic inversion is picking up the, the uh, fluid response with a drop in acoustic impedance in the target zone and a drop in the VPVS ratio. We can make a cross plot of v acoustic impedance and VPVS ratio, which is shown in the next plot, and that's for the well log data itself. The upper left subplot shows the whole target zone. The color is two way travel time. And you can see there is a trend going from the upper left corner in that subplot. And with increasing two-way travel time, we move down to the right-hand corner. But you see there are also some anomalies plotting off that trend. And if you look at the next subplot to the, to the upper right, we focus on the, the reservoir zone itself. And you can see here that there is a trend pointing down to the lower left corner of that subplot, which is really the fluid trend. The colors in this subplot is actually the porosities from the well log data plotted on top of the seismic inversion data. So the colors are from the well log data there, but the, data, the impedance versus VPVS is still from the seismic inversion data. The same accounts for the lower left subplot, where we have, uh, the color is the clay volume, and you see that most of the data that has a fluid trend in the previous subplot is uh, plotting with low V clay. So we know we are in a clean uh, sandy reservoir zone. There's slightly shaly zone also intra reservoirs that has slightly higher clay content. But most of these data are quite sand rich. And the final subplot, the lower right hand corner, shows the color is now the saturations from the well log data on top of the uh, data points from the inversion data. And lo and behold, we see that the water saturation is low, which implies that the gas saturation is high uh, in the lower left corner of that subplot, which is really uh, in agreement with what we do, would expect from uh, Gassman uh, theory. But it turns out that, again, we were talking about these compaction trends earlier, and in this area we have several wells, and it turns out that the, the um, structural setting is dominated by um, quite uh, varying burial depths in different wells. So the same stratigraphic level can be located at quite different burial depths. And here we have included a seismic random line intersecting several wells, including the wells we just looked at, the Itegrita well. But you see that, for example, there is one well to the right in this plot that intersects the, the same target level at a much shallower depth. And you have a gas discovery all the way to the left, the Sigri gas discovery, which encountered gas at the same stratigraphic level, but it's deeper uh, burially. So we might need to take these different burials into account because the rock physics properties will change as a function of compaction and burial depth. And that's highlighted in the, this next slide where we actually include uh, observations from several of these wells. And what we see here, we have a cross plot of acoustic impedance versus VPVS ratio for the well log data in these different wells. And we have some brine sandstones, but we also have some gas sandstones. And you can see that in different wells, the values of, the, for example, the brine sands in light blue can have very different impedance and VPVS values depending on which well they are, which is really corresponding with the compaction or the burial depth. We also see here that the change going from brine saturated to gas saturated has a drastic effect in the impedance and VPVS ratio, but that effect is largest at the shallowest well. So when the sands are less compacted, you see a much larger fluid trend or fluid sensitivity than when the rocks are stiff and compacted. 
as we see in the lower right corner of this plot. And we're going to try to now go back to the extended elastic impedances and, and, and take this into account. This just shows the Wellog data plotted in a cross plot of acoustic impedance versus VPVS ratio. And the colors are the estimated extended elastic impedances at 24 degrees, which is really an angle that where we found that the changes will correspond to change in fluids. And now it's been normalized to the average value in the reservoir zone, which is indicated by the start of that white arrow. And then you have going from brine to oil to gas. And you see that the extended elastic impedance values change along that trend. But there is also, again, a compaction trend. So remember, this is from one well. What if you go to a different well where you are at a different location on this compaction curve? Okay, so one way to estimate extended elastic impedance from acoustic impedance and VPVS ratio is just to make a linear regression, assuming that the trends are linear. Of course, we see it from the rock physics model that they are not. But just take the, let's take the, t uh, the tangent at the point that is indicated here. And then we estimate a regression line and we calibrate that to impedance values. And we can create an attribute that just measures the distance away from, from this tangent. And that's plotted as the colored values in this cross plot. We can have a look at how this attribute, the solid elastic impedance, compares to the extended elastic impedance at 24 degrees, which we already know corresponds well with the fluid changes. And this figure shows petrophysical data and the estimated impedances for the Itagrita well. To the left you have the clay volume and water saturation, and you see the high gas saturation in the top there. And then we have the acoustic impedance, and to the right in the log display you have the the uh, red curve that is uh, not showing very well, it's behind the black curve, it's because they are very similar. The black curve is the uh, solid elastic impedance on top of the extended elastic impedance that is estimated from the Whitcomb formulas at 24 degrees. And you see they are pretty much the same. And the cross plot of these two gives just a straight line, so it's a perfect match between these two. So it's just demonstrating that we can actually extract the extended elastic impedance directly from the cross plot of acoustic impedance and VPVS, which is very nifty in this case where we had inversion data of acoustic impedance and VPVS, but we did not have the density which is required to estimate the extended elastic impedance using the original Whitcomb formulas. We can do this also for a, a different rotation angle, for example, minus 50 degrees, which, seen, which we have uh, shown here, corresponds well with the shear modulus. So if you estimate the shear modulus for the Wellog data, the upper right subplot shows the color, the color is corresponding to the shear modulus, and you see that the extended elastic impedance at minus 50 degree rotation has the same trend at the share model is. And if you cross plot these two, in the lower left corner, you see that there's a very good match between the extended elastic impedance at minus 50 degrees and the share model is, which is really a compaction or lithology indicator. And we can also extract the, uh, what we call a solid elastic impedance of this angle, which will be just a different regression line and distance away from this line. And we have plotted that the colors to the left represent the solid elastic impedance corresponding to that minus 50 degrees, which is a lithology uh, indicator. And the map view to the right shows the distribution of, of uh, geological structures that corresponds to where red color is the stiffer values and blue are the softer values. So now we can actually identify maybe some of these sand bodies, but there is also a trend in compaction there where the blue are less compacted and red is more compacted. But the f let's go back to the fluid and try to detect the fluids. Now we look at this solid elastic impedance which corresponds to an extended elastic impedance angle at 24 degrees, and this, the upper sub, uh, subplot to the left, uh, left corner shows in color these solid elastic impedance corresponding to this angle, which should highlight the fluids. But, and the map view to the upper right shows how the red and yellow colors, which are really the, where we would expect the, flu, uh, the hydrocarbons to plot, 
are, are distributed uh, around uh, quite randomly actually, but you see some patches that might be interesting drilling projects. So, well log is, uh, that integrated well is uh, indicated as a small circle in the lower uh, part of that map. However, in the upper two subplots we have assumed just a, the tangent of this rock physics model. But why don't we just look at, because over the whole map view we know that we have different compaction uh, regimes because we have a burial trend. So why don't we take into account the rock physics model that actually incorporates this, this compaction trend, which is the curved black line. So instead of just taking the tan tangent and creating a South Alaska impedance representing the deviation from this tangent, let's do uh, what we call a curved South Alaska impedance, which is the deviation from the curved rock physics model, which is really honoring the rock physics or the compaction of the rocks. And you see the map view doesn't change very much, but let's have a little further look. We'll see in the next plot. Okay, so this figure now shows uh, just uh, highlighting the map view that we showed in the previous one, where we are plotting the curved South Alaska impedance at the top target horizon. And you see the Itagrita well location is shown there, and the colors now representing this curved South Alaska impedance which is really the distance away from the curved rock physics model. And the yellow and red colors will be where we expect the hydrocarbons to plot. And we see that gas is identified around the well location of Itagrita. But you also see there are some other uh, interesting yellow and red spots further north of the well that has not yet been drilled. Uh, let's just create a random seismic section from the Itagrita well in the south going north trying to cut through these and have a further look at these. So we'll look at the 2D section and you see now that uh, we go from quite deep, uh, um, the Itagrita target is indicated to the left, the well is penetrating that, in the yellow colors to the left, but you see that there are some interesting yellow spots also to the right, but much shallower. This figure now actually shows the South Alaska impedance where we just made a tangent to the rock physics model and didn't really incorporate the curved shape of the rock physics model, which means that we don't really honor the compaction trend. And here, because we have big differences in, in the burial depth, we should really honor the compaction trend. So that's why we use also the curved South Alaska impedance, which is shown in the next figure. And if you compare now, you can do it back and forth, you see that the prospects or the anomalies that are further shallow are actually growing, so they might actually become more, even more interesting. So you have some uptip, potential prospect uptip at the same stratigraphic level, but also shallower stratigraphy, there are some uh, interesting uh, yellow colors that could be potential prospects. So to conclude, we have shown how we can uh, link extended elas elastic impedances to trends in rock physics templates. We have shown how to create what we refer to as solid elastic impedances, which are really regression lines in the acoustic impedance versus VPVS ratio domain that correspond to extended, extended elastic impedances. And these can be calibrated to the local rock physics models. A higher order curved regression line better captures the compaction trend than a first order linear regression. And these South Alaska impedances can easily be implemented to classify seismic inversion data into fluid and lithology cubes. And we have demonstrated how to map potential prospects in the Itagrita area in the Norwegian Sea using this South Alaska impedance approach. Finally, I would like to acknowledge Telewoil Nor Norge and Noreco, licensed partners of PL591, for allowing us to show this study. And thanks to QI Labs for producing the simultaneous seismic AVO inversion data used in this study. With that, thank you very much and have a nice day. Thanks.